want to do in Pennsylvania. Um, the campaign for women's health began um, in some respects um, back when the Obamacare was being discussed. We at the Law Project were trying to figure out what our role, where we should participate in this. And we did this major study called Through the Lens of Equality, where we looked at women's health through their legal states. Um, and though these are issues that we worked on for the, the history of the Law Project, we were surprised to learn how women's legal status has such deleterious effects on their health. So, for example, we looked at sexual assault and domestic violence, and what we found that well beyond the injuries that are connected with sexual assault and domestic violence, women suffer significantly more other health consequences, like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, PTSD, of course. And we found that with caregiver responsibility, we found that with workplace discrimination, and of course, the, the key and the polarizing issue that we've faced for so many years um, has been around reproductive rights and in particular access to abortion. Um, and um, when, as we were writing this, we also realized that we've got to fix this, you know? And we published this in 2012. In 2011, the Pennsylvania legislature spent one third of its legislative days trying to figure out how to deny access to abortion in Pennsylvania. And remember, that was, we were still in the throes of that terrible economic crisis from 2008. And it was at that time that the Women's Health Caucus with Senator Schwenk and Representative Franco and Representative McElhaney decided it was time to revitalize the Women's Health Caucus and came to us and said, do you have any ideas? I said, uh, like 26 of them. <laughs> We've got plenty of legislative ideas. And um, obviously, with their hard work and the, uh, 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 reaching out to other organizations, uh, the Pennsylvania Agenda for Women's Health developed. And what's been really important in looking at the Pennsylvania Agenda for Women's Health um, is we decided that it was time to stop being so defensive and let's be proactive. So let's say, gee, you people are pro-life, but why aren't you helping pregnant women in the workforce? You know? And let's you know, just go back to Friday and remember one of the essential benefits that people don't care about, pregnancy and maternity care, right? You know, because someone who was upset, I don't need it. This, this happened. His mother needed it. <laughs> you know, um, but the, the total lack of concern for, the, the, for women who want to have healthy pregnancies, and generally the women who aren't protected in the workplace, are at the lower income scale, you know? where they're, they're working in nursing homes, they're working in areas where there aren't male counterparts to bring sex discrimination claims under other existing law. So there are big loopholes in the law. Lots of people think that pregnant women are protected. They're not. And of course, we have issues around nursing mothers. What's more important than a healthy baby? You know, um, having access to breastfeeding um, in the, um, um, and being able to um, have private places um, in the workplace. We also have the, what we've known for years, the problems with equal pay. Um, we have to talk about these things more. Um, uh, there have been a whole range of issues connected to sexual assault and domestic violence that still need improvement. So we have now 55 organizations um, that are involved in this. We see it as a huge effort to engage in community education around these issues. We know we've got a long haul with the legislature we have in Pennsylvania. We are now fighting very hard um, related to the most recent bill to prohibit abortions after 19 weeks in Pennsylvania and to prohibit the most common medical procedure that's used, the D&E procedure that could also criminalize a doctor who is helping um, with uh, a miscarriage. It's again because people who are legislating women's health know nothing about it. And we have a bill connected to fracking. Our patient 
Trust Act um, to, to, to really work with um, uh, to develop legislation to tell doctor to tell legislators to stop practicing medicine. Learn that civics lesson. Go back and read that civics book from seventh grade and learn what you're supposed to be doing. But in the meantime, you know, stop practicing medicine. Um, so I, I urge you to learn more about the, the campaign for women's health. I think that it's intersectional. Um, and just, just one last thing I want to say in my 15 seconds, that one of the things that I think became very obvious in this last election and was very distressful to many people, which was how many white women, 52%, voted for Trump. Um, and um, it, we have to do more work in that area. Um, the most reliable voting bloc are African American women, always have been, um, and they really don't benefit <laughs> for the work that they do. But we have to find out why so many women in our state of Pennsylvania um, uh, are frankly voting against their own self-interest, their own economic security, their own health, um, and their own safety. Uh, and we can't just put that under the rug. It's not that different than it's been in most of the previous presidential elections, um, but, but we've got to move the needle on that. We've really got to move the needle on that. So thank you. I hope at some point everybody gets a chance to hear about the other, I think it's 18 points in the 26 point agenda for women's health care. They are all, they're all really critical, they're all very different. It was the first time that I knew as a legislator that we really parsed them apart in a way that allowed legislators that weren't pro-choice or that weren't pro-life to get on bills together. It's a really, really important agenda, so I hope it's moving around to be visible while we're up here. Um, my name is Brian Sims, I'm a state representative from Center City, Philadelphia. And um, I know that everybody here has sort of a certain agenda for what, what they want to get out of this. Some of you want to be better activists and better advocates. I know that some of you want to be candidates as well. And um, that's my goal, so that you know why I am here, um, what I came from Philadelphia for. And that is that I, I currently work in a legislature where I want a lot more of you to work alongside me. Um, it's really simple. I, I hope that, that as we are sort of going through this period of civic awakening, our sort of Bolshevik revolution, that I hope that one of the things that you're all seeing is how approachable these jobs should be and can be. Uh, forgive me for not being in a suit. I, I had intended to be. Oh, I'm going to tell you why. I'm coming from my boyfriend's house. <laughs> it really was. I, 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 I got up to come here. I put on a suit and I didn't have any dress shoes. And I thought, do I, do I not show up because I can't be in a suit? And I thought, no, that's, that's life. That's who we all are. And if that kept me from doing something like this, that's a big mistake. And I, I want you all to be thinking that as well. Um, rather than trying to find those candidates that inspire you the most, become those candidates that inspire your neighbors the most, that inspire your friends and family. Um, I, I know two very important things about the Pennsylvania legislature, and it's two very important ways in which we are broken. First, we are the most gerrymandered legislature left in America. Um, if you were going to study gerrymandering at UCLA in Southern California, you were going to study Pennsylvania. Um, we are really the last state left in the United States that lets whatever party is in control of the House for the most part draw lines that are so incredibly insidious that the last time it happened, the Supreme Court held them up. They said, no, no, this claim you have is a 10. If you dial it back to a 9, we'll allow you to pass it. And they did. Um, so what we have is we have a state that has about a million, a little over a million more registered Democrats in Pennsylvania than Republicans. You know, there's a lot of people in the state that are unregistered or aren't registered in the two major parties. There's 4.1 million registered Democrats in the state. I think it's about 3 million registered Republicans. And yet, the Republicans control both of our chambers by wider margins than most of us will see in a lifetime. And um, it is the backdrop for every piece of progressive legislation that you will hear us speak about, is this idea that we are in a place that is structurally broken. The other way in which it is structurally broken is that there are not enough women in the building. And I know it sounds wonderful to have a guy stand up in front of a room of mostly women and say, hey, you know what, we need more women, but it is much, much deeper than simply being a representative democracy. Yes, we're a representative democracy, that's wonderful. If you 
still are lucky enough to be taught civics in middle school or high school, you'll learn about that. And you'll think we have a 53% women in the state population, we should have 53% women in our state legislature. And that's great and that's true, but that is certainly far from what we have. And to be clear, I think right now China has 28.5% women in its legislature. Afghanistan, I think, has 29.5% women in its legislature. Pennsylvania has 18.4%. 18.4% of our legislature is women. That means that not one in five of the people making major decisions about this entire commonwealth have the average life experience of more than half the population in this representative democracy. So why does it matter beyond the esoterics? It actually matters quite a bit statistically. Um, we've been studying what electing women to bodies, to legislative bodies does since about the early 1970s. I hope all of you are familiar with Emily's list. Um, Emily, early money is like yeast. It helps the dough rise. We figured out, frankly, in the years before I was born, that if women candidates got early investment from other women, that their candidacies were more viable. They could last longer. They could be better candidates with early investment from other women. And one of the things that Emily's list has done over the years is that they've actually studied the impact of those women on the legislative bodies that they were, that they were elected to. One of the things that we've learned is that women in state legislatures, especially, don't tend to focus on the periphery. They don't tend to focus on the 10% of the BS. I've got to watch my mouth in here. Um, <laughs> this is always kind of um, um, <laughs> um, Women don't focus on the, 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 the try to the crap on the left and the crap on the right. Um, oftentimes, they will tell you the, truth, the jobs are too hard to get to focus on that stuff, but it's purely about optics. They actually want to get the job done. Um, I think that if you were to take, and I know we have plenty of time to talk about this, but I think that if you were to take the, a list of the top 10 things that happen when you add women to a legislature and put that up next to a list of the top 10 complaints that most of us have right now about our democracy, I promise you nearly half of them would cancel each other out. You know, the most progressive voter right now in America is an African American woman between of 25 and 34. You know, for all the talk about what progressives think and what progressives would do, I haven't seen a panel of just all African American women in that age group in a long time. That's why I want to hear from them. We're doing a lot wrong in the Pennsylvania legislature with how we advocate for things. We're doing a whole lot wrong in how we stand up with our collective progressive voices. But one of the things we're doing wrong right now is that we have the wrong people making decisions about all of us. Um, Barney Frank, my favorite member of Congress, used to say that if you don't have a seat at the table, you're probably on the menu. <laughs> How many of us feel like we are on the menu right now? Um, I get credit often with being the first openly LGBT person ever elected to the Pennsylvania legislature, but I will tell you that no building that has that much marble in building hasn't had gay people in it for all time. <laughs> Well, it's actually true of sexual minorities as well. And, and there's nothing biological about 
It's that, um, that, that Ginger Rogers thing. It's having to do everything that Fred Astaire did, the backward and in heels. It's that level of credibility that you learn just to keep up when you're told that you can't keep up. And it's something that is missing in politics today. In the halls of Harrisburg, the thing that is missing the most is a sense of understanding for other people. In the United States, a woman walks into a room like this and knows inherently that there are 100 diff 150 different life experiences, 150 different goals and choices and backgrounds. Men, on average, we really don't think like that. Now, if you're in this room, you're an exception to the rule like I am. We're on the other side of the Belfort, the good side. But on average, men in the United States think that other people are going to arrive at the same conclusions they've arrived at for the exact same reasons they've arrived at them. That makes a room full of men as deciders almost redundant. It doesn't make sense. And I, so I, I'm going to end with this because I, there's a lot we need to talk about. But we could triple the number of women in government in Pennsylvania. Actually, that's about what we need to do right now. We just need to about triple the number of women in government to get on par with our demographic. And I'll tell you a really interesting thing. We could all up here stop fighting for every progressive issue that we work on. Racial and ethnic justice, LGBT rights, women's rights, reproductive rights, nutritional justice, you name it. And if all we did was make sure that there were more women in the legislature, in both parties, by the way, the byproduct of more women in the legislature is equality across the board. I'm telling you, I would never have had to run for office if this was a state that had significantly more women in government. And it's a thing that we can do right now in this next cycle. There were 42 women that ran for, the, for a state house or senate in the last election cycle. My guess is you don't know who all 42 of them are. Um, I think what I like is that in this next cycle, we, we know who every single woman running for office, whether it's city council, school board, Congress, or, you know, or the Senate, and that we know that a part of their leadership isn't just because of who they are and why they're qualified, but it's also the ripple effect of what having more women in leadership roles in elected office will bring, and it will be good for all of us, I promise. Thank you.
keep this right to the state capitol. So we're meeting at noon at the state capitol in Harrisburg, and we will be um, going in to talk to various state legislators. On Tuesday evening, um, you may have heard about the, the, uh, the transgender student um, who's being sued in Boyertown. There is a, um, a meeting at the Boyertown Junior High School. Those who are interested are welcome to go and show support for the, the trans student who will be speaking. A um, couple more things about Invisible Works. I'm really happy to announce that we have found a meeting space. <laughs> Um, this church, this beautiful Unitarian Universalist church, has offered to let us meet here monthly at no charge. We're pretty happy about that. It'll um, it'll give us a chance to all get together periodically. But we made arrangements at the Exeter Public Library before we had this pinned down. So we have our meeting coming up in April, April, um, Deb, is it the 13th or the 18th? 13th. Um, it's a Thursday at the Exeter Public Library. And if you're on our website or get our alerts, you'll know all about that. So um, I think it was Anne who said, what did you say, get in your lane and own it? Yeah. Find your lane and own it. So really, we can't do everything. We can't. I, my husband has to remind me of that periodically. It's like, you can't do it all. Um, nor do you need to. We all have, we have a lot of people. We have a lot of energy. We have a lot of support. Um, so that's why we, um, we're going to give you a chance to meet with various advocates in, um, in a few minutes. We're going to um, send you out into this room. But now we want to um, take some questions. We've got wireless mics out there in the audience, and you can um, ask anything and let us know who you'd like to ask your question of. Barbara. Hi, my name is Barbara, and I have a question for Carol Tracy. And I feel like I'm lobbying the lobbyists, but um, if some of the points that you talked about were employment, violence, um, discrimination in employment, education, athletics. Um, these affect trans women. And I wonder how inclusive you, your um, bills are, your legislation that you would like to get pulled through, include trans women as well.
be supporting um, the grim you know, GG. So, um, so most of the trans inclusive work would be in the courts as opposed to legislation, but however we support all the legislation. Um, And the rest of it is intended to endear us to people. And 
And I think we aren't doing people a service by saying that, yes, it's a lot of money, it's raisable, it is doable. You know how I know? Because 253 members of the Pennsylvania legislature do it every couple of years. Um, it, it is from, for one of the reasons I did it, because I, I looked outside of my region. You know, I, was, um, I ran against a 28-year incumbent, and I wasn't going to be able to fund that in, in Philadelphia. You know, if you were a union giving money, you could give a guy like me money, and that was okay with me. Um, so I went to affinity communities around the country. Um, just last election cycle, I had numbers in all 50 states. And my average donation was like $34. Um, 